One of the many, many things that I love and appreciate about rap is how much I've been, a, how much I've learned from it uh, about life, stories, lessons, perspectives, ideas, and then uh, also creatively how clever the writing is. And that's something with the, the sung in place, probably my favorite line or word plays or whatever is you were talking about losing your appeals, but you hadn't lost your appeal. Mm -hmm. so, so as a writer, I wanted you to explain from your perspective, even though you've changed and evolved dramatically, I would say, I would also say most people probably do think of you still as a gangster rapper, street rapper, what have you. But why do you think, given all the gr amazing storytellers, amazing lyricists we've talked about that are gangster rappers, why do you think that they don't get more reverence or more attention for being great songwriters, great lyricists, having these clever lines like you do on the sunken place that I just cited. I think that we have cannibalized ourselves, and we've, but specifically for the West, because most of those MCs came from the West, but those like Karis One, Rakim's, uh, Slick Rick's contribution, like what, like the the problem is that the Highlander, there can only be one philosophy with being the dopest MC combined with the American, the African-American illness of, you know, I'm, I'm better than everybody and y'all can't see me about nothing. We play marbles. It's like, F y'all, I'm the best marble player and therefore F your family, do <laughs> everything you believe in. Like we, there's extreme competitiveness, and in being that extremely competitive, we have uh, a propensity for cannibalizing our own. And so, therefore, nobody wants to stop for a second and say, Ice Cube and his prime is the best rapper on the planet Earth. And there is no dispute about that. It is not a dispute that. You know, there was some seriously dope MCs and people who would want to dispute it. But my stance is, arguably, from about 88 to somewhere by the time Tupac grabbed that thing and ran with it, Ice Cube was the dopest rapper on the face of the planet. And his run was about as, as similar as they could understand what Wayne did from probably 05 to 12. Like that window, he was the dopest rapper on the planet. And the reason why people don't say that is because they want to be considered the dopest rapper on the planet and don't view it as tying themselves to that legacy being relevant. If there is a Hall of Fame for hip hop artists, then statistically, and I say metaphorical stats and literal stats, I have to know who else was really good. You have to have a Joe Montana to be able to say, and that's why Tom Brady's the GOAT. You got to be able to say, I saw Joe Montana play this game. And for a reason, this dude right here is a savage beast. And then I can say, well, if Joe Montana played with his rules, he'd have nine rings. So now, and you know, that and their debate rage, rages, as opposed to it being owned by these magazines and blogs and people outside of our culture who don't necessarily perceive it as a, Procure. Now we see people like Shaq have a podcast, people like the athletes themselves, football players who have podcasts. And now the honors and the critiques are coming from people who have actually participated in the culture. And that's as a coach, you don't have to be a player, a rapper per se, a producer per se, to have been, hey, it's some water boys who know more about football than the average fan, for sure. He's been standing there with a front row seat for 10 years. He knows football better than a fan that's just been watching on TV. When the camera cuts, he's still standing here when the coach is giving the speech. He just automatically knows more. So an engineer is going to be more equipped to have a conversation about hip hop or somebody like yourself who's been studying this, that you're from the culture. I think that it, as those of us from the culture and we can teach this down, that there is a requirement of understanding who was dope before you 
that is inherently embedded within you being an MC, that it is a mandatory part of participating in this culture. And if we could just stand on that, then we would end up with better music. We'd end up with more honor, people who are expressing appreciation for those who preceded them. There's no reason that I should have so much respect for John Lennon and Paul McCartney as songwriters. And I don't have no respect for Ice Cube and Dr. Dre's run as songwriters, as a team, a songwriting team. And so you see other genres that have honored theirs, but we haven't honored ours because as soon as a couple gray hairs pop out, then we're trying to cannibalize the old lion so the new lion can take over the territory, kill all the kid, the, the cubs, and procreate with your women. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that's kind of the error in our perspective is that we are always attempting to conquer the land and pee on all the trees and take all of the spoils of war, as opposed to it being considered more of uh, uh, a league and that it's an honor to be in this league and that the people who who built this league and the people who were the best participants in this league require honor and respect and uh i think that's something that we're missing right now big time i agree wholeheartedly because everything you just said as well as a hundred other the reasons and you know one of the best albums of 2024 if not the best one is the master ace and marco polo richmond hill and ace came out in the 80s and he's in 2024 putting down phenomenal material and it just shows that as long as you're an elite artist like master ace is one of the best of all time Facts. it doesn't matter he's still putting out phenomenal music yep everybody who had anything to do with the symphony all of them had an impact on me. I I dug into everybody's career from there the the ones who you know everybody knew Koji Rap and, and Big Daddy Kane, like, but everybody else, oh man, Marley Marl, top five dead or alive forever. You don't have to make another beat. And so I just think you, you know, if we aren't honored and actually like he's an old head, so therefore, and it's like, come on, man, you, we're not going to respect, we're not going to respect our own culture enough to just honor our own elders and just salute them and, and learn from them still because there, there's still an opportunity to do that so yeah shout out master ace i was tripping off of his his work maybe a day ago just had a couple conversations about the fact that he was getting down and what he was doing and i don't know maybe killer mike getting the grammy can wake some people's game up or jelly roll doing so well winning best new artist at 38 years old <laughs> maybe that can have that can cause people to appreciate the OGs a little bit more. I think it's necessary for the culture to, I wouldn't survive is a harsh word. I would say to thrive, to, to thrive. Okay. Yeah. And then <clears throat> since most people look at you as being from Sacramento, the, the thing, uh, as I learned more about you over the years and being uh, what impact or how did it affect you moving to Sacramento from Texas early in the game of your life? Being, we're talking about this outsider, there's all these different things. How did you have to navigate that as a kid as you were moving and getting into the Sacramento world? Was that super hard? Was it easy? Like what was what was happening? That's one of the biggest urban legends that's just utterly incorrect in the history of hip hop. Like I'm, I was born in Sutter Memorial Hospital in Sacramento, California. Hmm. I'm from Sacramento, was born there. I left the hospital and went to the South side. <laughs> I'm from the South side. So my mother was born in Texas. She was born in El Paso. Um, my grandmother's sister, Miss Brenda, moved to Waco, Texas. And so my grand, a few of my grandmother's sister and my grandmother, they all, my maternal grandmother, originated from Texas and migrated west following the Black Panther Party. So my grandmother took my mom and her sisters with no children yet and moved to Los Angeles to participate in meetings and things like that with the Panther Party 
And then they migrated north from Los Angeles to participate in Palo Alto and Oakland with the Black Panther Party. And uh, my big sister was born in, in Palo Alto uh, as a result of that. And then we moved to Sacramento and I was born in Sacramento. My family followed the Panther Party to Sacramento when they were doing the gun rights thing. And so that was how I ended up at being born in Sacramento. Uh, yeah, Miss Maxine, my, my grandmother was, was a bike ride and black leather wearing, you know, son of a gun. She wasn't, she wasn't playing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's how we ended up in Sacramento. So uh, me going to Texas was the other way around. I didn't go to Texas. I didn't come from Texas to Sacramento. I went from Sacramento to Texas to visit family and specifically in Waco and uh, some family in Fort Worth I was going back and forth between Waco to Fort Worth back and back to Sacramento. Uh, maybe twice in my life. I think I went to Waco in the very early eighties, went back to Sacramento, uh, went to Waco again in 87. Uh, I think, yeah, the 87, remember Doug Williams winning the Super Bowl. I was in Waco. And then coming back uh, right after the earthquake happened in Oakland, San Francisco during the, the World Series. So that's kind of how I got my markers of where I was. So, yeah, about two years between my father, my paternal side of my family is from Mobile, Alabama, uh, Pritchard specifically, which is right on the border of Chickasaw, my grandfather's. Uh, Native American Chickasaw, rest in peace to Benjamin Martin. And uh, so I would go from but getting left in Alabama for messing up a little bit, you know, being in my entire, my second cousins and that side of my family in Sacramento were all Crips. Everybody was guard blocked out. And so, you know, I was trying to be like them when I was a kid, you know what I'm saying? I even know you weren't supposed to. I got beat up for saying calling people cuz before I knew I wasn't supposed to. And uh, cause that's just what my family, that's what they said. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I ended up in Pritchard, Alabama for a while and came back to, to, to Waco and went from Waco back to Sacramento and then, you know, started making my music and things like that. But yeah, that's the answer to that question. It's ironic that's been out there for all these years and I just was never home to correct the record. I always just thought that was funny, but my birth certificate, my birth certificate says, uh, my birth certificate says Sutter Memorial Hospital, Sacramento, California. <laughs> now, as you said it, I remember that now I misremembered because I remembered when we would write each other <clears throat> when you were incarcerated, you told me a lot about being there as a kid. So I just misremembered. So I apologize for that. But I don't think you misremembered as much too as I know you knew because you've been, you've had information. We've, we've communicated very specifically about that, but it's like Apple music, like all these blogs had me as being from Waco, Texas. And I'm like, bro, I'm not from Waco. And my name is not Honore Jones. My name is not, you know what I mean? But I'm like Bigfoot. In a way, I had to understand it. Like, I'm like Bigfoot. People just had sightings of x rating There were no, you had the psychoactive picture, which ends up on the Exorcist cover, too, and the Vengeance is Mine cover. Like, there was no images of me, no music videos. Macroframalama got 20 million views on YouTube with no music video. It's just, so, so seeing me or having correct information about me is like having information about the Loch Ness Monster and the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> Well, that's why I'm glad we're talking about it here. That's what it's for. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Set, set the record straight, which I'm glad we're doing.